Aloha, welcome. Thank you for joining us. There's a lot going on these days, and thanks for coming to Think Tech Hawaii and sharing your concern and your attention with us. We have with us today Professor Ben Davis, retired from the University of Toledo School of Law, recently also at the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Law as a visiting professor, and now as a visiting professor at Washington and Lee School of Law. So peripatetic legal educator, and as the t-shirt says, dude emeritus. <laughs> so Ben, on the January 6th hearings, you've managed to kind of give a theme name to each of the days so far. How did you name the first day? So I thought uh, the day one in laying out the scheme of Donald Trump is was about the big lie. The idea that he was trying to put forward that the election had been stolen, you know, stop the steal, all that language. And the evidence that was brought forward of all of the various lawyers, advisors, political campaign types, et cetera, who made it absolutely crystal clear that uh, there was no evidence of any kind of widespread fraud and also the court cases that failed, all that stuff to just, and that was communicated to Trump so that there was no tr truth, not a shred of truth to what he was saying, which made it the big lie. And so day one was saying, here's, there was no problem with the election that was systematic. Trump kept saying it was, and various people around him kept saying it was, and there is the big lie. In fact, the big lie started before the election back in April or something. He was trying to say that if he lost, it was because the election was rigged. So. That was day one, the big lie. So how is it that there is still a, a huge cult of Trump supporters who are still arguing the big lie theory? Well, I, I think uh, one thing is that the big lie theory has been put forward by lots of different allies and supporters of Trump, so that if you're in certain kinds of uh, media silos, then, you know, that's all you've heard. And that's what you, you believe, or your Congress people are part of this. That's all you heard. And that's what you believe. The second thing is that, you know, if you voted for somebody, because you thought that they were the right person, to have yourself being told that what he is saying, or she is saying, is a lie is a hard thing to accept. It's cognitive dissonance. So, there is a sense, uh, I think, for people, of, gee, you know, that was my guy, uh, and uh, I thought he was a good, good guy. Maybe a little, a little harsh, but you know, he got me my tax cut, so I'm happy. You know what I mean? And uh, I think that that's probably part of what's going on here, um, for why people would continue to believe it. And then the converse of that is, of course, is that anybody who says anything that contradicts the guy you like, oh, they're just some kind of person from, you know, the, the conspiracy, deep state, whatever you want to do it, that is trying to discredit my hero, so to speak. That's the kind of, think that's a logic of a person who was in that spot. Okay, so beyond just adamant confirmation bias like that, is there really any theory for which there is any significant evidentiary support that this election was subverted, stolen somehow? Well, according to Trump's own people, the answer is no. Okay, what can I tell you? I mean, everybody that testified that there, who looked into these things, the, you know, the district attorneys, whatever, the ones who ran down all the rabbit trails, the answer is no, there's nothing, nothing. Zero. I don't know what I can say. Not a. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so when Bill Barr and many others acknowledge that, what's, what did day two 
of the hearings focus on? Well, I thought day two is particularly interesting because now that you know that Trump has been advised in no uncertain terms by the people he's appointed or on his campaign that there is no fraud, Trump immediately starts a huge campaign to raise money for what is it called his election defense fund, official election defense fund. And apparently he raises a quarter of a billion dollars ostensibly to quote unquote, fight the fraud. Again, there is no fraud, but to fight it. So the quarter of a billion dollars, and this was uh, when uh, led by uh, Representative Lofgren, and she coined the term, the big ripoff, which I think is really, really, really clear. Because if we have any history of watching Trump University or any of these other things that are happening along the way, sounds just like it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so do we have any idea where that quarter of a billion dollars has gone? Um, there's a whole series of issues of they're still trying to figure out, you know, where the money go. I do know that uh, it was reported that five million of it was spent on the event on guess when? January 6th, a million dollars was given to some uh, charity that's run by, uh, guess who, Mark Meadows, who was not contributing, who was not participating with regards to the uh, uh, meeting with the committee. You know, there, so there are a couple different places. There's this back and forth about whether uh, one of Trump's son's girlfriend uh, um, named Guilfoyle, got, she got a check for $60,000 for uh, speaking for two minutes on the mall. That's money. That's good money if you can make it, okay? Uh, and then there's this debate about whether the lady who headed up, heads up uh, Publix down in Florida was part of her check for $650,000 or as part of the quarter billion. As for the rest of it, it's gone apparently into a pack called Safe Pack that Trump put. And it's not any evidence that it's actually been used uh, at least have not been presented, that was actually used for any kind of election defense fund for the 60-odd cases. And correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't there an issue with regards to Giuliani getting paid for his services? <laughs> so as far as I know, I don't, you know, that, that money's sitting in some places in complete control of Donald Trump. And I would emphasize that I think Donald Trump wrote a cease and desist letter to the Republican National Committee telling him not to use his uh, image with regards to Republican National Committee uh, fundraising. So, you know, it really is like, like a real funnel to a big ripoff. And that points to another factor that may not have changed despite all of the things that have come to light. And that is that over on the Republican side of the fence, no one seems to have been able to exert the fundraising force, influence, and control that Trump has and continues to. Yes. Um, so I read recently that uh, apparently Ron DeSantis down in Florida uh, <laughs> has been able to start to funnel some of the money, or let me put it this way, some of the donors for Trump are starting to give money to the scientists, like to the tune of $24 million. But the kind of numbers we're talking about here of a quarter billion dollars, a lot of them for people, uh, you know, sending in twenty, thirty dollars for again a big lot. Okay, that's the thing. It, it's it's one thing to raise money for what you're trying to do, et cetera. It's another thing to raise money telling people there is a big lie, and then uh, trying to and, and people paying it in. I mean, it's it's kind of I've heard it referred to as. A, even a consumer protection kind of issue with regards to fraud, you know, in, in advertising kind of thing that would be state consumer protection authorities could even look into. So it looks like there's, they may have bought a lawsuit. I don't know. Hey, so from the big lie to the big ripoff, who, what did you see as the theme of day three? Uh, day three, I, I coined the term the big kill, which is really about essentially putting Mike Pence in a place at a point of risk where there was a possibility that he could get killed. One of the pieces of evidence I thought was really significant is uh, the or how the Proud Boys, these kind of gangs, right, 
uh, that uh, were essentially marching down to the uh, uh, Capitol at 10 o'clock in the morning when Trump was speaking only at 12 or one or something like that. So they were down there sort of doing pre-approach, verifying what, what were the weak points and all that. And then they started going after the, uh, the, uh, the, the barriers and all that stuff, kind of softening up the target, if I could say it like that, so that when the crowds come down, they can go over and the whole thing happens. But the significant thing for me was that there were people who gave, or informants who had said that if they'd run into Pelosi, if they'd run into Pence, they would have killed him. And so it was essentially kind of setting up a situation that they were in harm's way. And then you would have these intermediary, so to speak, groups who, oh, I'm terribly sorry. Look, Mr. Pence has been killed. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Ms. Pelosi, what a horror. You know, you can do that kind of thing, but you've set him up to be at risk, right? And uh, that was uh, in the same way that, it, uh, you know, you feel like the, all those Capitol Police officers were set up to be put at risk. Uh, it was very emotional to listen to the commentary of one of those, I think the first day, the woman there who said that, you know, she'd been trained as a police officer, right? But yeah, she can't be trained for warfare. This was warfare that they, that they were living. All these people were being set up with the idea of a big kill, uh, kill in terms of it looked to me that there were, I mean, Trump would not have, it actually says at some point that maybe uh, Pence deserved it when people were chanting that hang Mike Pence thing, which, you know, for your vice president, I mean, that's a little much. Uh, but beyond that, uh, when Pence is shepherded away, it turns out that he was only 40 feet away from the uh, uh, insurrectionists at one point. That's how close it came to them getting their hands on a guy that they said they wanted to kill. And moreover, when he's down in the basement or somewhere in the in the, in the capital, and uh, they want to whisk him away in those, you know, with the Secret Service and all that, he's nervous about who's driving the car, and he says, "I'm not going anywhere." And I guess part of it was his concern about how it would look to see the, the him go away uh, from the White House to the world. I mean, from the Capitol to the world. But the idea of him being a little nervous about who was driving the car, just I mean, it, it sounded to me like. This was like an effort, a big kill with him. And uh, I don't know, they didn't get into this, but I'm curious about what, there was some discussion I remember over time of Trump sort of magnum, magnanimously declaring martial law, right? You know, that would be, that was sort of something I heard about a couple or three weeks ago as sort of part of the plan that you have chaos and so he could declare martial law and then, you know, down that path. But it really looked to me from what it, every, what it was presented, was that uh, it was definitely uh, a sorry it, it was definitely a uh, uh, the term for the day was big kill. This was about killing Pence if he didn't play ball. So, in your view, with the information available, did, what did the evidence indicate about what? the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the rest of them knew about where to break in with the least resistance, where to go once they got in, and what the opposition to them was likely to be or not be. Well, that's been part of what was interesting on that day. So there was a document that was revealed in some uh, DOJ case called, I think it's 1776 again or something like that, which was a detailed nine page document that laid out from the Proud Boys internally about how to take over essentially Capitol Hill office building, right? So that there was a, this was something that was organized ahead of time and it said detail who plays this role, who plays this role, you're the lead, or you need a second, and all that kind of stuff. So it, it you know, almost like military style construction. In addition, you know, you had these proud boys who went into the room, went into the Capitol in what they call stacks, which was a new word for me, which are the uh, these lines of sort of militarily camouflage wearing guys going up in uh -huh. to, to, to go into the building with uh 
Um, so there was a, a lot of evidence to show that this was very systematically organized by the Proud Boys, that the Proud Boys uh, were essentially responding to a call from Donald Trump to them. Um, uh, and they were even recruiting based on that call. And uh, I mean, there seems to be a lot of evidence that uh, th there's nothing spontaneous here, that this thing was very systematically set up. And then you, mo you move the, uh, the crowd up to the Capitol and, uh, and you put all these people in harm's way with the idea of getting the counting of the electoral college votes suspended or stopped. And so we know that they knew and planned and acted in advance on where to break in, where to go once they got in, where Vice President Pence and Speaker Pelosi and others were. And they went directly for those targets. So oh, yeah, and, you know, and I should just add something that there's this, the video of a representative named Loudermill, you know, taking people around the day before kind of showing them various, you know, security sites in, inside that was part of what was the presentation too. I mean, literally now going and pointing out members of Congress who were allies or supporters of what was happening and putting them before the question of, please explain what you were doing, you know, fascinating to watch. So days one, two, and three, what did that, bring us to in day four, in your view? So day four, I call the big elector scam, which is basically the state by state elector scams in the seven states that Biden won, the swing states, to try to get alternative electors put in place. And uh, here, uh, the evidence uh, was from mainly state officials or poll workers pointing out the amount of pressure that Trump laid directly on them but also the cooperation of entities like the Republican National Committee. Or there was a, a Congressman Andy Big, who was pushing the folks in Arizona. Or, uh, uh, you know, uh, there was even the, the, the fake slate of electors uh, signed these fake forms, these fake elector forms from Michigan and Wisconsin that. Uh, there was uh, an exchange between the chief of staff of Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, literally 20 minutes before the uh, vote uh, of the, the meeting on January 6th with uh, someone on the staff of the vice president saying, hey, uh, Ron Johnson's got to give something to, to the, the vice president. And the person from the vice president asked, uh, 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 vice president's uh, staff says, what is it? He says, uh, it's alternative electors from Wisconsin and Michigan forms. Uh, and the person from uh, the, the, that had not been received by the National Archives, apparently. And the other person came back and said, do not give them to them. The thing that's really heavy about that right now is last night I was watching on Rachel Maddow, is that the National Archives had actually received these alternative elector documents and had never passed them on. So that they did have them for Michigan. They did have them for Wisconsin. So the chief of staff of Ron Johnson is telling a lie with regards to what had actually happened with the National Archives. And that makes it even more intriguing, right? Doesn't it? I mean, there was basically, hey, I'm going to throw a little story here. Or maybe they just didn't know the fact that they'd actually been received. Or maybe they'd been told they had been received. But it's a, it, Ron Johnson's head is in, you know, is, his head is in the box right now. This just like uh, that louder mic uh, guy's head is in the box. Anyway, the, the key thing again is that these are all people, who, for the most part, who had voted for Trump in the state legislatures or staff that refused to go along with the scheme because they thought it was illegal. And secondly, there was no evidence that was for their states on the basis of which that they could move forward with doing the kinds of things like calling special sessions of the legislature and all that. So from what we're seeing, uh, are those strategies continuing to expand and be put in place by 
the Republican operatives at state and local levels for not only voter suppression, but for vote subversion, electoral counting, and electoral designation subversion? Right. right. So yes, in this sense, that if you can get the legislature to pass a law that makes that law, well, that kind of works for you. So for example, uh, if you've got, sorry, just my guitar fell over, sorry. Uh, with, uh, um, for example, you know, there is this effort to basically increase the power of the state legislature to override what the vote by the people of the state will be in terms of setting up electors. If you have a law that says that, as opposed to this ad hoc structure, that's a risk. And apparently that's a risk that's uh, being played out in Arizona. In Georgia, you know, these various kinds of efforts to say that uh, local uh, election commissions can be over, uh, overridden, overseen, um, uh, replaced by people from the political branches like a secretary of state. Again, you get your right kind of secretary of state in place, you can play playing machinations with that. So yes, there are Republican operatives who are working aggressively in various states to essentially weaken the control of uh, elections by the sovereign act of voting by the people and put it into the hands of political persons. And that's unfortunate. And we've seen that in the most recent hearing days with Ruby Freeman, Shea Moss, election workers whose lives have been subjected to incredible disruption and impairment simply oh. because they did their job. Yeah, and I, in, an, in another session, I talked with you about this, that I used to be a poll worker, uh, not a poll worker, a poll observer when I was in Toledo for 17 or 18 years. So I used to sit at the uh, polling places and observe what was going on. And uh, I tell you, and I don't know if anybody else has done that out there who's listening, but it is one of the most moving experiences of your life to watch ordinary citizens vote. It is just beautiful to watch all kinds of people, all shapes and sizes and looks and whatever, sitting down, you know, whether they got tattoos or no tattoos, whether they're in a suit or they're in running pants, you know, sitting down, doing their citizens' duty. And secondly, the poll workers working aggressively, or not, not aggressively, but working studiously and diligently to make sure everyone is treated fairly. And so when I heard what happened to Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman, I was actually at the pool talking with somebody about it, saying it was really shameful. And a guy came up to me and he said, yeah, my wife was working down here in Charlottesville as one of those election types. And the stuff they had to deal with, you know, as an election worker, you know, was awful. He was upset too, you know? And, you know, that, that kind of subversion of who does the actual uh, poll worker role is another thing to be concerned about. And so there's two aspects to that. One, you have poll observers who will be agitated and try to get in the way of people voting. And I would say that the solution that was done up in Toledo when this happened was really simple. You got a poll observer who was obnoxious. They got kicked out by the poll worker, the, the judge of the chief poll worker. The second at level is within the poll workers themselves, okay? And that's another concern. And I don't know how you remove a poll worker at a polling site during the, the middle of an election, but I, I know that there's an effort to become sort of these insidious poll workers who go against the oath that they take. But I imagine that there are controls you know, sort of like alternate poll workers sitting in the background. So that if somebody acts obnoxiously, the, the chief can say, get rid of that person and bring in another one and we'll continue on. So that's the hopes that I have is that people will challenge the people who don't respect. And I mean this, the dig I mean this, the dignity of ordinary citizen voting. It, it's a most beautiful thing. It'll bring tears to your eyes if you ever do it as a poll observer. So in our last couple of minutes here, how does this all bode for 
the 2022 midterm elections. What do you ex expect to see in that process, in those elections? Um, I, uh, from what you're seeing right now, um, you're seeing, uh, I think, Donald Trump's balloon going down within the Republican Party. It's not saying that there aren't a lot of Republicans who like him, but I think I saw something about 20% of Republicans were saying that Donald Trump should be held responsible or something. When you have those kind of numbers happening, the end result is going to be that there's going to be some difficulties for Republican candidates. You know, Now, this, the irony is, of course, Republican candidates are trying to sort of put themselves in place as I am the Trump light, so to speak, uh, uh, and, you know, and, and sort of using the language of Trump. Um, and then Trump is desperately trying to make himself relevant by figuring who to what to uh, endorse or unendorse and endorse the other one, looking for the winning horse, because it's always about winning, not about anything else. So my gut feel is that uh, uh, it's going to be uh, an, an election full of a lot of craziness. But at the same time, um, there's going to be um, the basic issues of inflation and all that stuff that are going to work against the Democrats. And then on the other hand, there's going to be these concerns about, do we really want more of these Trump kind of people on the Republican side? There may be Republicans who will sit out uh, from voting because they're so disgusted with everything. But I encourage everybody to vote, OK? please. Don't sit out, everybody vote, vote for the person you believe in. Um, but personally, I don't see how a Democrat, an independent or Republican could have vote for a Republican who did not break with Donald Trump, I, I, based on what I'm watching in these hearings so far. And we're talking about the Department of Justice today and trying to corrupt that. And I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm in the middle of those hearings uh, right now. So I'm still finding out the kind of effort that he was doing there. I mean, this stuff is so appalling that, you know, I just say, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or an independent, I don't understand how you could vote for a Republican who did not break with Donald Trump, whatever they like. So on that note, Ben Davis, thanks for your insights, your input, and your decades of legal scholarship. <laughs> Thanks all of you for joining us. Come back in a couple of weeks. We will be back again with more law and social justice issues. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, be safe, be well. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.